Cardi Show. I'm Lynette Cardi. I'm so happy to be back with you. And today we have a wonderful lineup of authors that are going to be sharing their great works with you. It is my pleasure to welcome not only what a, who I call a sisterin, but also a soror of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Dana Rondell. Welcome. Dana. I'm so happy to have your talented little self here, Thank beautiful you. girl. Thank you. So you are an artist, a writer, a speaker. Uh, when did you start writing? Well, I actually started taking writing seriously in 93, um, but I didn't have my first book published until 2006. Okay, and what was that first book? That book was entitled, the Sun I'm sorry, that's my children's book. Mm -hmm. um, that fl a flower, it has its own song. Oh, okay, and that was a children's book. No, A Flower it Has Its Own Song was my first novel. Okay, yes. wow, yes. okay. And when was your first children's book? My first children's book, uh, The Sunflower and mm -hmm. Rose, was actually published in 2010. Okay, 2010, yeah. and this is um, a picture of it. It's beautiful. Tell us the story that's inside for this. Well, The Sunflower and Rose is about a young lady mm -hmm. named Rose, and mm -hmm. she's around seven years old, and she has a wonderful relationship that she develops with the sunflower. So it's about love, it's about friendship, it's about the power of the imagination as well as music and dance. Okay, now you are a really um, moving and spiritual sister. You can tell that when you meet you, that you. you have a power and a light within you that shines. So I want you to tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write Rise and Reach. That is your only book that I have read that I just found phenomenal. Uh, Rise and Reach, a Life and Leadership, was inspired by my mom. Mm -hmm. I am an inspirational writer, speaker, mm -hmm. uh, author, as well as a minister and spiritual advisor. Mm -hmm. And I've been um, a spiritual advisor for a number of years now, but I was asked because of um, my opportunity to support leaders and to advise them to actually put in writing the concepts, the principles, the wisdom that I used over the years for my life as well as for other people's lives. And that's how Rise and Reach came about. But I wanted to make it more than just a focus on leadership. I wanted to be focused on our life as well, what makes a great life. There are a number of people who can apply what it takes to make a great leader, but what does it take to make a great life overall, as well as incorporating within that great leadership? Yes, and I know some of our audience members, as well as those of you at home, want to know what some of those things are. Mm -hmm. Give us a couple. Um, well, first and foremost, I love the golden rules, and I expand on those yes. within the book, um, basically to be true to oneself. Mm -hmm. For when we are true to ourselves, then we can be true to everyone else, and true to our dreams and everything that we want to do in life. And it's also do unto others as you want others to do unto you. So to treat people kindly, to um, if you're a leader and you're guiding people, how would you want to be guided? How would you want to be treated? And so take that into consideration when you're the leader of a group or a community or, or our country, for example. Yes. So it's basically taking into consideration not being just the leader, but being the person that's being led. Okay. Um, I have a, a favorite quote from your book mm -hmm. that um, I want you to talk a little bit about. I'm going to share just a piece of it. And the quote reads, <clears throat> seek nothing outside of yourself for inspiration, wisdom, and power, and let all life inspire you by witnessing at all times its magic, which invariably unfolds before us. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. That's my favorite in the book. Well, Just that seek nothing outside of yourself. Yes. That, um, I'll let you speak to it, and then I'll tell you what I got from it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I do expand on quite a bit within our Rise and Reach Life and Leadership is our relationship and alignment with the omnipresence. Yes. Um, I like to use the, the name God. Mm -hmm. um, some people use infinite intelligence or Allah or creative universal force, divine love. There are so many names. Higher that, beings. Higher being that we use. But I generally use God. Mm -hmm. And it's basically focused on our relationship with God. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent, omniscient. Yes. And God is within us. And if God is within us, that means there's really nothing outside of ourselves that we need to seek because all that we need is within us to create the life that we want, to attain our goals, to attract the type of relationships we want, etc. So when we're praying to a higher power, we're really going within ourselves 
and we're praying, we're having a conversation with ourselves. Yes. What is it that we're seeking to do? And how are we going to take the steps to do this and <clears throat> excuse me, and co-create with God this particular goal or this dream or this life that we're creating? Yes, that's exactly what I got from it. That God is within us mm -hmm. and really we have to dig deep form that bond, that relationship that he seeks to Absolutely. have with us as well. Absolutely. And all of those questions that you have about yourself within yourself, the answers are there. Absolutely. So that's that's kind of what I got Absolutely. from it, yes. Um, I thought it was also very thoughtful of you um, and very different um, that you left blank pages for us readers mm -hmm. so that we could put our own notes, our thoughts, our views, our perceptions, um, um, the pieces of light that it ignited in us. Yes. What inspired you to do that? You know, I started doing that back in 2010. Mm -hmm. I had um, three, three books that were released around that time um, outside of my novel and my children's book. And there are three inspirational books. Um, one is called uh, The Gathering of Daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, one is called May Every Voice Sing. And the other one is called Mahogany Soul Rise. Mm -hmm. So it's a collection of books. You can purchase them separately, but also as a collection. And within those them. books, they're mm -hmm. very inspirational. They have songs and verses okay. and, and songs mm -hmm. and, and a little bit of poetry, et cetera. But they're, they were written to inspire you and to draw something out within you. And whatever that is that it's drawing out, something beautiful, something positive, your own thoughts, your own poetry, your mm -hmm. own song, to write it down, make it your story, make it your song, yes. and use that to create your life, create what it is that you want for yourself. And so I, I love that. I love the fact that we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to not only read something that inspires us, mm -hmm. but to journal. And that's why I wanted to include some of the journaling pages so that when we are inspired by a quote such as uh, you were or um, a thought within the book or a concept mm -hmm. or a piece of wisdom, then we can jot that down and we can talk about what it, why it inspired us or how it inspired mm -hmm. us. I am, you know, I'm a lover of books. Um, when you gave me this book along with all the other books that I own, I really hate to write mm -hmm. in a book. There's mm -hmm. something about writing in a book. You know, when you go to college and you see everybody highlighting, it was like, oh, I can't, I can't write in this book because we were raised to really kind of treasure books. Mm -hmm. And so I love it that you actually had separate pages so I didn't have to mark the actual page, you know, and I could like write, rewrite the quotes that I liked on another page. So I, I love that. Um, now, you are the founder and the lead minister over uh, Wisdom in New Dimensions. So please tell us about that. Well, Wisdom in New Dimensions is my church. Um, we okay. initially started out as a nonprofit, and the focus was to expand consciousness through the arts, uh, through sciences, and through um, music. Mm -hmm. um, as I continue to do the work as a spiritual advisor and working with other spiritual leaders and ministers in various locations here in Connecticut and outside of Connecticut, um, I was basically being motivated or inspired or urged mm -hmm. to become an actual, a, a minister. And so instead of uh, just focusing on Wisdom in New Dimensions as a nonprofit organization used to expand consciousness through the arts, um, the focus then became how do we uh, bring God back into the dynamic and to um, basically show the importance of, of our spirituality mm -hmm. through the arts through music, through whatever it is that we're doing. And so that was what um, Wisdom in New Dimensions actually started to grow from, from that perspective. That's so awesome. Wisdom in New Dimensions is now a church, and we are chartered out of Hartford. And um, oh, right now our church is a church without walls. Okay. But what that means is that I am still a traveling minister. Yes. Okay. So I have the opportunity to still work with other ministers and leaders outside of Connecticut as well as in Connecticut and Great. pretty much travel to wherever I'm going to travel to advise and mm -hmm. to do the beautiful and inspirational work that I do. Yes, and people are <laughs> thirsty for the word, thirsty. Yes. So lastly, before we close, I know that you're also the founder of Partners in Goodwill Publication yes. and Media. And so I know people out there who are interested in having their works published. Yes. There are some budding writers out there in the audience, budding writers right here, this you know, columnist and myself thinks every now and then that I might put some of my works together and, and publish something. Um, is this a publication company? Can people come to you and how do they go about all that? Well, Partners in Goodwill is my publications and media company. Mm -hmm. And the focus is to create those who are writing material to create inspirational works. 
Um, I will take a look at the, those works, although I am very selective about what we will publish. Um, okay. But I will take a look at those works and decide whether it's a fit for Partners mm -hmm. in Goodwill. Um, and that writing can be uh, music, it can be film, it can be for TV, it can be for radio, or it can be an actual book. Um, if someone is interested in uh, partnering with Partners in Goodwill or publishing through Partners in Goodwill, then they're very welcome to send us an email and to let me know, and I will take a look at that. Um, if, I don't know if I should share my website. You can, now. absolutely. So there are two ways to get in touch mm -hmm. um, with me, um, and that's through Wisdom and New Dimensions, which is windinc.org, W-I-N-D-I-N-C.org. And Partners in Goodwill is spelled exactly the way it sounds, partners with an S at the end, in goodwill.com. Great. Thank you so much, Sardana Rondell. Please get her book, Rise and Move. <laughs> when we come back, I will have another author here who will tell you all about his book, and it's amazing, a true story. Stay with us. Mr. Carty <laughs> Lynette. Thank you so much, Archie. How's everyone? Everybody's good? Everybody looks so beautiful today. Gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, my, my real name is Lynette Carty. Not Chianti Dotto, like everybody calls me. I don't care where I go, I'm always Chianti Dotto. Which I don't mind. Except a woman in the bathroom went, smile, and I smiled, and she said, yeah, I'm a city gal in the teacher. Little <laughs> big daughter. I was like, yeah, I'm the big one. I'm the big daughter. I went to get a drink, and that's the first thing the bartender said. I was like, hi, my name's Lynette. She's like, I know you're a daughter. You gotta be kidding me. It's crazy. Everybody knows my dad. I always tell this joke. I'm going to tell it today about how many people know my daddy. He's got a best friend, and his best friend's name is Charlie Palmer. And Charlie's always amazed that no matter where they go, people know my dad. So my dad says to him one day, look, I'm going to go to Italy. I'm going to go see my friend, the Pope. You want to come with me? I'll introduce you. Charlie's like, you don't know the poor man. <laughs> you know the poor man? Daddy's like, yeah, man, come with me. So they hop on the plane. They go to Italy. They get to the Vatican. And outside of the Vatican are thousands of people. My father makes his way through the crowd. He gets to the Vatican door. They open the door. They let my dad in. But Charlie's got to stay. So Charlie's amazed, first of all, that they open the door and they let my dad in. After about five minutes out onto the huge balcony steps my dad and the Pope. People start cheering. And Charlie looks up and he is amazed. Next thing you know, he faints. <laughs> My dad rushes down the Vatican steps, rushes through the crowds, kneels by Charlie's side. He says, Charlie, I can't believe you fainted. I told you I know the pole. <laughs> Charlie said, that's not why I fainted. I fainted because that Italian man right there just tapped me and asked me, who is that guy in white standing next to Ed Cardi? <laughs> So before we bring up Bishop Patrice Smith to bless the food, let me tell you a little bit about her church. I found out that in order to join her church as a couple, that you actually have to abstain for a month. So there was three couples that wanted to join her church. And the pastor told them, you must abstain for, for a month before you can join the church. So the month goes by, and the three couples come back to the pastor. So the first couple comes up, and they're like, Pastor, we did it. We've been married 25 years, and it was no problem. I just slept in the guest room. <laughs> so the pastor says, wonderful. Come on into the church. The next couple comes up, and they've been married for 10 years. And the husband says, Pastor, it was a little difficult. 
we started out in our own bedroom, but after three days, I realized I was going to have to go sleep on the sofa. <laughs> but we made it. And the pastor says, welcome to the church. Yes. The last couple, unnewlywed couple, both of them had their heads down. <laughs> the pastor said, what happened? The husband spoke. He said, Pastor, you know we newlyweds, right? <laughs> pastor said, yes. He said, well, we thought we would be all right. He said, after the first night, we was okay. After the second night, we were okay. But on the third day, she decided she wanted to paint. She bent over to pick up a can of paint. <laughs> I became filled with desire for her. We made love right there on the spot. The pastor said, I'm sorry, you know, you can't join the church. He said, I know, we can't go back to Home Depot no more. <laughs> Looks like me, acts like me, 
talks way too much. I don't. But she does. <laughs> and um, she's around all boys. My sister's husband comes from a family of many, many boys. So their grandmother has nine grand boys and just her. And they're all between the ages of five and nine. That's like, wow. So we find her there the other day. And my sister said, oh, yeah, she bought the word around. I said, we need to have a talk. But she's at that age. You know, she's six. So we pull her to us. She's just looking up all bright. She's like, yes, mom, yes, Auntie Nat. We're like, where's your private part? She goes, right here, right here, right here. So we're like, well, who's supposed to touch your private parts? Nobody. I'm like, well, what if somebody tries to touch your private parts? I'm telling everybody. <laughs> but what if they say they're going to beat up your mommy and daddy if you tell? I'm still telling because my daddy could be anybody. <laughs> so where's your private parts? Right here, right here, right here. Who's supposed to touch your private parts? Nobody. We're like, okay, you can go. She walks off, and my sister and I actually high five each other. Good job. She turns right back around. She goes, Would you see her? But could I touch theirs? <laughs> So I'm, I'm constantly trying to lose weight. So I was in McDonald's waiting on my supersized fries. I don't even know why they say McDonald's is for kids, because they know it's for adults. They just use the kids as a way to get us in there. And why do they even call that supersized? You know, the sizes should be, oh well, just this once for small. Oh my goodness, I've been a bad girl for me. I just don't give a darn. I'm a super size, so I just don't give a darn. There I was waiting in line. And it was crowded. Bloomfield McDonald's, you know, lots of kids, lots of people in there, and I'm waiting. And this little boy is looking at me. He could have been more than about three or four. And I know I'm a tall girl, but this is how he's looking at me. <laughs> so I look down and I smile, you know. And he goes really loud. You're large. <laughs> Everybody in McDonald's was laughing. The manager, the workers in the back, the people coming in the door. And I could tell his mother was a little embarrassed. She backed his hand and she was saying, she's tall. She's tall. Oh, he's, he's not finished with me. <laughs> so then he goes, you're pretty. And I'm like, I love this kid. I'm buying his one. <laughs> Nowhere. He goes, Why you got green crayon on your eyes? And I'm thinking, I gotta stop doing my makeup in the car. <laughs> he asked me so innocently, so innocently. But that, that's kids, right? My niece, Candace, her brother, Blake, she and Blake are just a year apart, just like, like a couple months, like a year and a month. We look at my sister and we're like, they're a year and a month apart, so Blake's birthday comes first, and um, he was turning five. No, he was turning six, and Candace was going to be five. So my sister got him, you know, the birthday cake. We're all there. We sing to him, whatever. Wish him happy birthday. And he goes to blow out the candles. It's just a little bit, just like a little bit of spit. It's the cake. Oh, Candace takes a fit. Oh, I don't want that piece. I'm not going to eat that piece. He got spit on the cake. And so my sister said, look, I'm going to cut that piece. Blake will eat that piece. And your friend will cut a piece of the cake that don't have no spit. Okay? So here it is. Three months later is her birthday. So we're out at the ball. Oh, we're saying, what kind of cake do you want? I don't want no cake. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want no cake? You're having people come over from your school. You've got to have a cake. I want cupcakes. 
you can't have cupcakes for a birthday. You need to have a birthday cake for your birthday. She's right. And she's like, no, I want cupcakes. I'm like, why do you want cupcakes? I want everybody blowing their own candles. Everybody <laughs> blowing their own some clips from Dana Rondell's book. So here for this second segment, I told you I would have another fabulous author, and he is here today, Mr. Malik Brooks. Welcome to you. Thank you for allowing me to be on your show. Absolutely. I'm so happy that you came up from New York. Malik is the author of Convicted at Birth, and this is a copy of the book, and I'm telling you, this book is amazing. Amazing. So it's a true story. It's about Cooley Jr. Tell our folks, first of all, what made you write this book and a little bit about the book and how this young man really um, had to turn to the streets. Well, uh, what, what initiate, initially what caused me to write the book was that while incarcerated, uh, there was individuals who was telling me that people was capitalizing off, off of my name Kool-Aid while I was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So I said, if everyone else is capitalizing, it's best that I write the true story about myself so I can capitalize as well. And that's what inspired you to do it. So did you start writing the book while you were incarcerated? Yes, I started writing the book while incarcerated. I think I had like uh, 20 years in at the time. I had mm -hmm. 20 years in. You know, I did 22 years. So at the, at the 20 year stint, I began to write it. And what, what caused me to really go to the streets was the abnormality in my household. You know, I had an yes. abusive father, I had an alcoholic mother, and it was just terrible. It was pure abnormalities. You know, it caused me to look for comfort in, in the streets. So I have to ask, um, I have to ask if two things are true, because I just have to. Right. Um, your dad in the closet. Yes. That was true. That was absolutely true. Uh, me and my mother, we was going, as the book described, we was going to cash her welfare check at that time. And my sisters, they stayed in a, they stayed home. They didn't go with us. And on our return from, from the ca cashing the um, check, the house was still. It was very quiet. Mm -hmm. It was very quiet. And then when my mother went into the room, I heard a scream, a high-pitched yes. scream. And I ran into the room with my mother. And she seen blood. She seen blood on the sheets of the bed. And then she just opened the closet door, and my father and Ronnie was the uh, gay guy that he was having sexual intercourse with was in the closet. You know, you, you see, yeah. yeah, and it was very disturbing, especially for me. I was a young kid at yeah, the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. And then that's the other thing I wanted to ask you about um, when your dad was beating on your mom, and you tried to defend her, and he had a, a razor or something, yes. and he ended up cutting you razor. and you're up in the back. Yes, and. Um, you know, as a lot of women do, they defend their man to the, the end. And that really happened. Absolutely. I have the scars if you want to. No, want I don't to want to see, see it. Scars. Okay. Yes, he, uh, you know, in defense of my mother, I love yes. my mother. You know, I love yeah. my mother more than I love anyone. Yeah. You know? And he was brutally, brutalizing. brutally brutalizing her. And as a, as a saver, I tried to save my mother, and, you know, he turned the razor blade upon me. You know, and I have the scars. Yes. That, that's going to last forever. Yeah. yeah. So. so we kind of connected on Facebook. Right. I um, was very impressed with the quotes you put up each day. Last year, I tried to make it a point to put up a quote each day that was either inspirational or something to help one of my friends. I have about three friends that are going through really, really tough time. And I, I feel bad because a lot of people thought that I was writing about myself, but right. I wasn't. I really um, was using that time to kind of reach out to people who I really thought needed it. And I started reading some of the things that you wrote and that I made it a point to every day read um, your quotes. And they're amazing. You're a really gifted writer. I appreciate that. So you must have started writing before you were incarcerated. No, actually, I was illiterate before incarceration. 
Yeah, I couldn't read or write when I went to prison. Wow. Yeah, I've learned that while in constantly. But however, I write my particular quotes. I write my own quotes. I don't utilize anyone yes. else's quotes because, you know, oftentimes we look up to people and that causes us to look outside of ourselves. So I think it's, it's imperative that we look inside ourselves and we understand the, the, special, the special individual that we are. You know, and let somebody quote our quotes yes, exactly. instead of quoting everybody else's quotes, you know. So people should look up to us. Exactly, exactly. So. And we talked about that in the first segment uh, with Dana Rondell, and that's one of my favorite parts of one of her quotes is about, you know, looking into yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, looking into yourself. So Absolutely. I appreciate you saying that. So your book is a wonderful mix of, you know, a little humor, very little, but sadness, and violence, there's some eroticism in there. How did you blend all of that to make this really a riveting book? Well, actually, I wasn't trying to really... No help? help? No, no help, no help. Actually, I really wasn't trying to appease anyone. I was just sharing my story because I know as we sit, in, as we sit down and speak, as we're speaking, there's someone being brutalized, there's someone being abused, there's someone being raped. There's a parent somewhere that's not, that not acting like a parent. Yes. They're brutalizing their child. They're doing tremendous things to their children. And there's a there's a woman being beat up right now by a guy. Yeah. You see, so I was just trying to do this and because I know there's people who's living the life that I once and I'm trying to maybe I can try to prevent these things from happening mm -hmm. if they read my book. You know, because everyone can feel my book. Everyone's yes. been through trials and tribulations. No one's exempt from trials and tribulations. Absolutely. So, As my uh Family would say, you know, for somebody that's going through something, it just happens to be your turn right now. Absolutely. Because we all go through it. We absolutely. all go through it. So, would you like to see this book made into a movie? Oh, actually, we're working on a script now. We're working on a script for the book now and trying to uncover it into a movie. Okay. It's, it's, well, I want to play your sister, please. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in the movie. It's awesome. I it's really an awesome book. book. I, yeah. I definitely appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it's really, really. Yeah. This is an Great. awesome show. Thank you. It's a privilege to be on this show. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So what's your next project? Before we wrap, you got to talk about your next project. Well, right doing now, I'm, doing some, I'm doing some motivational speaking. I'm giving back. I just did a talk for NYPD mm -hmm. at a, a youth summit. You know, uh, I may, I'm mean, i going to write book two, uh, Going Through Hell, in order to come out right, convicted at birth. Okay. That's a, that'll be part two. But right now, I'm just trying to do some speeches. I'm trying to do some talk. That's, it's imperative that I give back because I took so much from society. Okay. So give us a peek at what book two is going to be about. Give me a little glimpse, a couple of sniglets before cheat? we go. You want to yeah. cheat? Yeah, I just want to know a little bit. A little bit. Cheat? People want to know. The audience wants what you guys want to know. <laughs> so, so book two is actually... It's going to be like my nephew is also going to be incarcerated. He's going to meet me there, oh, not knowing that he's my nephew. Nephew, okay. You know, wow, oh, that's good. Don't even give away anymore. Okay. That's perfect. That's perfect. Thank you so much for coming. I know you came from so far from New York, so you got to stay and spend a little bit of time with us in Connecticut. Absolutely. Please put your hands together for this fabulous author, Convicted of Birth. Go out and get it. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching the Lynette Cardi Show. Thanks to my guest earlier, Dana Rondell, and we look forward to seeing you on the next program. A big shout out to the crew, Armando, Miguel, and Chan. Thank you so much. I couldn't do it without you guys, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Lynette Cardi Show. And remember, me love you more than me love you. <laughs>